If he's called mm. Winnie the Pooh, and yet we call him Pooh or Pooh Bear, but his name is Winnie, why do we call him Pooh Bear if his name is Winnie the Pooh? Winnie. Like what? What is what is a poo? Yeah, what is the poo? I actually don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that that was what I woke up thinking about today. Shower I, shots with Jake. Shower thoughts with Jacob. <laughs> shower thoughts with Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but his name is Winnie. Like, come on. Like, yeah, like we, we you have never heard anybody reference to Pooh Bear other than as Pooh, Pooh Bear. And even, like, generally, I never hear anybody say Winnie the Pooh. Like, oh, that's Winnie the Pooh. Like, you reference to, like, the world of Winnie the Pooh, but he is Pooh. Maybe it's, like, Transformers, like, Prime. <laughs> Winnie's a group of warriors. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> All right, lead us in, lead us in. Like, right, like, the Primes. Like, there's Optimus Prime. Yeah. Primordial Prime. And this is Tommy. This is Jacob. Tommy, Tommy and Jacob's, Jacob's mixtape. Hey, hey, everybody. How's everybody doing? Uh, welcome back from a, a week off from us. Well, not a week. Well, yeah. we had a week off in a, uh, in a weird... Uh, well, hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Uh, I've so, been stuck at home playing Loop Hero. Yeah. So yeah, as you can, as as you, I'm pretty sure you can tell from the recording, we are now doing uh, another remote recording. Actually, it was almost about a year ago now when we had remote recordings because it was to Five Bloods and I think a banter episode in February that we did uh, remote recordings. Oh yeah, I was trying to remember which one was the remote recording. That one. Yeah. The Five Bloods. Okay, I remember that now. Well, yeah. So, uh, apologize, um, if the audio quality is, uh, you know, not, not the best, but you know, we're here for you because we want to keep uh, giving you content and I hope you guys enjoyed last week's episode of Willow, um, the bathroom that episode. Yeah. That, that, that was rough. <laughs> I like, I, I, I like agree. though that you came up with the name of, uh, TJ's lost tapes, the lost tapes, the lost yeah. tapes a... made me think of a uh, Mario and I remember like the lost levels, which was like on the super Nintendo. But it was originally yeah. Mario 2 in, in Japan. But yeah. But. Excuse me. Um, well, uh, let's get into this week. Unless, you know, you got anything else you want to say? No. Um, we are, this week we're going to be, uh, we reviewed uh, Legend. Uh, yes. 1985 to 86, depending on what country you are from. Yeah, that <laughs> was a really interesting thing to kind of figure out. Also, this kind of the history of uh, how the, or like how this movie slowly got made was interesting. Um, yeah, because also it started being filmed in 83 and then was mm-hmm. released in the UK in 85, December 13th, 85, and then the US April 18th, 86. Well, yeah, I had its first re- its first premiere was in France in August 28th. Oh, I didn't find that. Interesting. Yeah, that was that was what wow. I, I don't know, IMDB. That was like uh, its premiere was August 28th in France, which... So this was a real slow roll of a movie, basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it made sense with what it was but um did you i i was on, only able to find like um like its domestic box office number um i couldn't really find anything worldwide yeah i did you know, what are you talking Which, about the 25 to 23 million thing yeah exactly because like it was number 56 domestically yeah you know, when it was released um in 86 but i mean i i like i don't know why i mean i don't know if you found anything of like its overseas sales in that like pretty much year or six or eight months that it was almost a year that it was you know overseas yeah no i didn't really find anything hmm. well except for being like because well, it being 56 worldwide and says it just says worldwide it made 15 million and 86 hmm. but then even then like if you jump to domestically it's still 15 million so there is no real like track record of exactly what it made there's no difference between the two numbers. Interesting. Hmm. So I don't know exactly why it wasn't recorded. Exactly. It's probably recorded somewhere, but it's just harder to find, you know, online. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's a paper shelf somewhere for it, but yeah, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Oh, but uh, so Legend, um, like it's rating from like IMDb and uh, throughout. Uh, so it's got a 6.4 IMDb rating. 
um, had a 40% tomato meter, a 73% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, and then a 30 uh, meta meta score. So it's kind of mixed around, I feel like, you know? Like, audiences have enjoyed it, but, like, critically, not as much. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely the... Um, uh definition of a cult classic i would say that yeah that's a good way to put it um especially... because even on metacritic if you look at it for the critics there's one positive five mixed and five negative mm. so okay um before we get any further do you want to give us Sarah uh tommy synopsis satan attempts to kill unicorns that bring morning light yeah okay <laughs> 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 I like it, it's, uh, it, like it's definitely like the embodiment of Satan, even though he's not called Satan at all throughout the entire. Well, actually, if you think about it, maybe Father that he's talking to is actually Satan. Yeah, I was trying to figure that one out. That was um, Father, yeah. Mother, the Dark. I mean, at, at the end of at the end of the day, he's what saves this movie. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Like, oh, like uh, nothing like a good bad guy. Yeah. Um, uh, well, let's move so, into. Uh, uh, director and, and stuff and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a weird director for this movie. I will have to say that. It, it's also strange to think that this was actually all of his idea in a big way. Like he started this. It was his baby that he's he hired people around to find for it. Uh, this is directed, created essentially by Ridley Scott. Um, Which is, I was like, let's not bear in the lead. Let's tell him who it is. It's very bizarre that this is a Ridley Scott movie. <laughs> yeah, because, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if you know Ridley Scott, I mean, it's most pop famous for really Alien, like creating the Alien franchise. Um, and then uh, Blade Runner as well. Um, and I feel like Gladiator is probably the next biggest hit-ish. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I mean, that's why it's weird. Is like a lot of, like, drama. Because then you had Gladiator, you had G.I. Jane, Black mm-hmm. Hawk Down, yeah. American Gangster, like, Kingdom of Heaven. He's a very like epic kind of guy. Yeah. And a lot of the time it's very grounded in reality. And this was not. <laughs> no, not <laughs> at all. Well, and that what's interesting about that though is like what I found when I was researching it is that this all started because he just he wanted to make a fairy tale. He wanted to write and create he wanted to like direct a fairy tale essentially he wanted to create an original fairy tale so yeah he ended up finding the writer um william hortzberg um who is like a sci-fi uh novelist um that the, if, if, uh, there was only two other movies like he'd done some screenplays and one of them is angel heart and thunder and lightning but those were also based off of his books um, so really Scott found this guy and they worked for a couple of years on hashing out this entire like fairy tale, which is why it also, I feel like in story sense wise, this fairy, it's a very generic idea of a fairy tale. It's light versus dark, you know? Yeah. Like, like the hero must then go and defeat darkness. La da 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 da. Like the, the bad guy is <laughs> literally trying to make it nighttime all yeah. the time. Yeah, exactly. That's his grand scheme. It's like it's pretty like uh, stereotypical, like <laughs> black and white, good versus evil. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, did you get anything else with William Hortzberg? No, not really. I mean, um, he passed away in 2017. Um, and I mean, I like like the biggest thing about him specifically too is that he was in a sense the one uh, the one and only writer. So mm-hmm. any time that the studio were to pop their head in and be like, oh, we want to change this and that, he was the one that had to do all the rewrites, which is kind of interesting because mm-hmm. of how frustrating that would be. Because a lot of times since we've been doing this, it's like a, a writer drops the ball and the studio wants to make changes. A lot of the time, they'll just get a different writer. Yeah. they be like, thank you for your time. Here's your check. Next in line is so-and-so. But the fact that they actually kept him the entire time, and basically, what's interesting about this is that there are, in a very uh, Blade Runner kind of style, there are like four different versions of this movie. Yeah, I mean, there's th- um, a lot more d- characters uh, originally, or like the characters that are in it that had a lot more story to them. But it was just very detracting from the main plot, essentially. From well, what like I. I uh, the second that this was, uh, we were, I was done watching it with my 
partner, I immediately went online and was like looking up, you know, just some other things I might have missed because the movie itself feels incredibly choppy. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious. I was like, was that like just an editing thing or are there things actually missing? And the original uh, runtime for this was two and a half hours. So I went online and I found the Blu-ray that has oh, no shit. all the editions. Did you buy it? Of it. Yeah. Oh, man. That's coming in on Saturday. Okay, cool. But as soon as it was over, I was like, I want to, I want to watch the two and a half hour long one because the movie, the, the American, the U.S. runtime for it is an hour and a half. You're talking about an hour worth of stuff that yeah. was cut out. I wonder if it'll make it more interesting. But the the <laughs> runtime on this Blu-ray DVD is as approximately like three hours and thirty minutes. Man, that's that's a lot. That's that's. But I'm like super curious. That's interesting because I uh, maybe I'm just now I'm kind of projecting something, but I feel like I read something about like somebody saying like to like reboot this as like a as a two movie or three movie trilogy type thing like a two parter or a three parter you know because like there's so much more story that could be told inside of this world or maybe i was or maybe i'm connecting oh, we're gonna have a never ending story a, thing i don't know I was gonna say, we're gonna have a never ending story conversation again <laughs> <laughs> like i said maybe i'm projecting Yellow del toro <laughs> mini <laughs> series <laughs> fuck um <coughs> so yeah let's uh go into um starting also before we get any like in, after we do starring i also have like a makeup and cinematography i wanted to like kind of bring up as well oh cool yeah. um, um so yeah let's go into uh who this movie stars it's got th- uh, two really big stars and a bunch of well i guess yeah anyway um definitely starring tom cruise if you don't know who tom that, cruise is have we done a movie with tom shit, cruise that shit crazy um I don't think we have. Um, I'm looking real quick. It's like does the he, no, he does have a part in that. No, he's our first. Tom, is this our first Tom Cruise movie? We've been wor- working around him apparently. When we talk about Tropic Thunder every once in a while, but a lot. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> Tropic Thunder. He's definitely come up before. Um, I don't think we have. Um, no, I'm not seeing anything that maybe. <clears throat> I mean, I'm trying to think of if he like a bit role in something. Tropic Thunder, um, but. <laughs> We never reviewed that. I know, I know, I know. Um, but if you really don't know who Tom Cruise is, probably most famously known for um, being a Scientologist and batshit crazy. Um, uh, but uh, movies, uh, Mission Impossible franchise, um, Top Gun, well, around this time really like Top Gun, Risky Business, Cocktail, The Outsiders. Um, and like he just like blew up in Hollywood. Like Jerry Maguire, he's kind of in a lot of, he's in a lot of, different shit well it's crazy about tom cruise too is i didn't realize this he's only credited for 50 titles really yeah on his list of acting he has 50 and i was like wow for how famous he is like i mean i think everyone no matter i don't know i feel like yeah. everyone has a favorite tom cruise movie also because he's been all over the place well, what's interesting now that i think about it going from like the early 90s forward he really didn't, he did like maybe a movie a year or something. Like he didn't really do like, he, like some people, you know, are in like multiple movies a year. Like, yeah. In a weird way, I almost feel like after like maybe like days of thunder, like you could probably like, I don't know. I feel like I could almost like name his entire like filmography moving forward from there in a strange way. You know what I mean? From Days of Thunder? When did that come out? That was like 1993 or something. Oh, here it is. 1990 on the dot. Oh, that was 90. Oh, wow. Maybe not then. Because um, that's when he met Nicole Kidman. But like, Oh, I, we also talk about Vanilla Sky a lot. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that's Tom Cruise. Let's get off Tom Cruise because apparently we can talk about Tom Cruise for a long time. <laughs> I just, But I like to ask this, especially for the really big actor like types. What is your favorite? A uh, Tom Cruise movie? Yeah. Ooh, uh, off the top of your head without like Vanilla looking Sky. at Vanilla Sky. Yeah, I yeah, I mean, I I I because I just I like the the twisted nature of that film, and I don't really think Movie. Tom Cruise is one of the best actors in the world. I just think he, I mean, he's good at what he does. Um, have you seen The Edge of Tomorrow? The time travel one that he does, or it's like a time loop no. one. I think you would really like that. I just thought of when you said that. I just thought of Sky Captain. Oh, Remember that movie? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, I really think you would like 
you would really like The Edge of Tomorrow. It has Emily Blunt like- in it. But yeah, there is there is actually it, the sequel's been in developmental hell, but like eventually, like it's getting a big pop on Netflix or something right now, so it might actually happen. Um, but yeah, it's it pretty much the entire movie is about like it's like a Groundhog Day action movie, but oh, cool. he, he's aware of the Groundhog moment in a weird way. Well, you know, of course he is, but yeah, um, I think you'd like it. I think mine's a. Uh, uh hair between probably Minority Report or Collateral. I haven't seen either of those, actually. you never seen Minority Report? mm Oh, you would dig that shit. That's like... Is that the one when he has obviously. gray hair? No, Collateral is where he has gray hair. He's okay. like a hitman. And that's that. with Jamie Foxx, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then Minority Report, he's like a a future detective. Like, he... Is it kind of like a noir? Crime. Kind of. Kind of like a sci-fi future... Basically, right. yeah, he's part, he's part of this, like, group that can, like, have the ability to see into the future and stop crimes. Lo and behold, he's at work one day, and he sees himself commit a murder. So he has to figure out who this person is that he's killing and why. Because he doesn't know who they are. Yeah. It was, huh, okay. it was, it was a, kind of a mind fuck. Kind of cool. All right. All right, moving on. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's enough Tom Cruise. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Do you want to go with um, the love interest first or the villain? Let's go with Mia. Go Mia, Mia Sarah. Sarah um, probably you'd recognize her most from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. She plays a uh... Sloan. Sloan, thank you. I'm like I was gonna call her Simone. I was like that's not right. No, oh, Sloan. Um, and it, it, she's in that weird Birds of Prey series that I found that trailer of from like early 2000s. Yeah, she plays Harley Quinn, which actually yeah. is kind of a good fit. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> like, is. I right? like, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I can see that. I really, I need, I really want to find it, that series for free somewhere and watch it because it looks so awful. And I, oh my god, it it reminds me of that really bad Mortal Kombat series that I found that nobody knows existed. What if it's like good, bad, like Cobra Kai? Sorry, uh, like Cobra Kai? Yeah, like Cobra Kai is hot garbage, but it's really entertaining. <laughs> like I love that. <laughs> yeah, Cobra Kai is very much, but Cobra Kai it strangely has like a good like uh uh like production value to it. It's just it's all just like it's all just spoon fed type shit though. Speaking yeah, of, I mean, have you yeah, started season four yet? Yeah. Okay, I'm only on like the episode episode three, so I love it. Um, it, I think it works because it knows what it is. Yeah, it's very aware of what it is, but yeah, like, but that's also kind of, of that's what saves it though is that it knows what it is and it leans into it and it does a good job with it. And I love watching old white guys like beat each other up with karate. <laughs> he uh, fucking kills me. God. Uh, okay. Okay. Um. Oh, so yeah. That, that Mia Sarah, she plays Lily, the love interest in this. Um. The. Um. um the princess that fucks everything up. Yeah. Um, and then at the end of days. so, uh, and then we have our villain who is darkness played by Tim Curry, who is extremely unrecognizable in this role. And I think it's one of those things at one point in your life, if you know, if you're a really big fan of Tim Curry and you realize this, he played this character, you're like, no fucking way until you actually kind of like put it together and just like the performance of it. But it's because it was one of the most strenuous, like, with like this movie and like the Grinch, like it's one of those where like the makeup and prosthetics that needed to go on him were such a long process. He's not recognizable. Well, it's like, yeah, it's like he's completely unrecognizable until he speaks. And then you're like, Oh, and it's one of those. I feel like even if you didn't know it's him, you'd be like, I really recognize that guy's voice. And it's like, yeah, you would. Mm-hmm. He's got one of the most iconic voices in like Hollywood. Well, speaking well, speaking of that, because like he's like one of the reasons he got uh, that Ridley Scott wanted Tim Curry was because of his performance in Rocky Horror, um, because he loved he loves he loved that Tim Curry had a very theatrical um, way of performing and speaking. So yeah. like his articulation with everything, oh darkness, father, <laughs> just like. <laughs> um, but like I think before this, like, and then he also did Clue. Um, um, he is the original Pennywise. Um, he's in Muppets Treasure Island, and he has. Oh yeah, he's Long John Silver. He was really I'm good. I'm surprised you didn't. Fuck, wow, I okay. forgot about that. Oh, it's the things that you forget about, Tommy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't. What's up, what's fucked? It's fucked up too. Is I have it written down in front of me. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, and I would say. I also, I, I always, I'm always surprised by how large of a voice career he has, just voice acting in general. Like, he's in, like, so much 90s, like, animated stuff. Yeah, he's the bad guy in The Mighty Duck. He mm-hmm. is what's his button gargoyles. Oh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dude, right? The actual, like, guy? Is that who I'm he's, thinking he's, of? He's fucking Nigel Thornberry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Which I did not, which I did not know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's in Voltron, he's in Batman Beyond, he's, he's in, in the Reset. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, he's the bad guy in Fern Gully. He's just... Uh, oh yeah, he's Hexus. Yeah. 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 He has a huge voice career. Mother's milk. Delicious. <laughs> Jesus. I love that's where um, you always go to. I do want to point out, though, too, that I don't know if people know, but there was, and I'm looking for it right now, but I can't remember what year. If I see it, I will update that. Um, but he is in, there is a Disney version of The Three Musketeers yeah. that came out like in the 2000s or so, and he plays the Cardinal oh. in it, and it is one of, in my opinion, one of his best performances as a villain besides this, besides Legend, because Legend, he's just iconic, but him as the villain in Three Musketeers, he was terrifying and he was amazing so if you haven't seen that and you like tim curry i would just watch it just for that even more terrifying than pennywise i i mean and i feel like pennywise is like a a split camp some people like especially as adults find pennywise to be very goofy that's kind of what the terrifying thing is about him i don't know i mean i personally and this might be blasphemous to people i like the new uh, what's his butt oh bill skarsgård is an amazing pennywise as well but it's a different aesthetic yeah, but like that to me is terrifying. I find that Tim Curry is just goofy and it doesn't really do anything for me. All right. Okay. Well, I think a lot of more people were just kind of terrified by the clown aspect of it, really. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, you know, he's walking around. It's kind of like <laughs> mentality. Um, but yeah, that's Tim Curry. Um, um, for, if you want to fun down memory lane, go look at his IMDb list and just be like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that show. Um, yeah, I mean, and then there's a couple other there, there's a couple other actors and actresses in this that were kind of that if you were to see their their stuff you'd be like oh I recognize that person from other stuff but I kind of want to go into makeup and cinematography if you're cool with that yeah I, I just wanted to throw out a uh, uh, Billy Barty's in this which I thought was funny <laughs> yeah uh, Billy Barty is um, the high Alduin in Willow mm-hmm. and uh, with his makeup and stuff in this I didn't recognize him until he because he he does this kind of a uh, Scrunch, he scrunches one eye really hard. You're talking about Screwball, right? When, yeah. Yeah. The one that gets thrown into um, the pit. Yeah. 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 Um, and it wasn't until he made that face that I went, I know you. And I just thought it was funny because we just released Willow and mm. yeah, Billy, Billy Barty's in it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right. So the makeup artist for this is uh, Rob Botton, who did uh, makeup on Mimic that we reviewed about a year ago. Um, the Howling and The Thing, the 198, John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, I've still never seen that. You've never seen John Carpenter's The Thing? Oh, mm-hmm. man. That's... I know, it's been on my list for a long time. Yeah. Um, I, I had... Ah, hey, man, we, we did this research a while ago. I'm now realizing how much I forgot I wanted to talk about with this stuff. But, yeah, so uh, that was the makeup arts. I just kind of wanted to give them, I guess, a shout-out because... The makeup in this movie is phenomenal. He created this entire world with Ridley Scott. Like, well, yeah, character it's, designs it's, and stuff, you know? And especially, yeah, like, the makeup crazy. of Darkness, like, is insane. Like, I, I, I read that the giant horns, like, at first, like, Tim Curry was having problems walking around because they were so top-heavy. And they eventually had to, like, find a way to, like, counterbalance and counterweight it for him to actually, like, perform and move. Well, yeah, I mean, because also, I mean, for context of people who haven't seen it, these his horns are ridiculous. They're about, like, three times the size of Hellboy's yeah. in Ron Perlman. You know, like, they're ridiculously huge. And they're super leaning forward, kind of like... Yeah. They're not like a ram where they lean back towards the back of the neck. They're, like, four feet in front of them. <laughs> yeah. No, he he looks like a legit, like, hell demon. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like he looks no, like the, he looks like the idea of what a lot of people envision Satan to be. Oh, I mean it's it's uh 
uh, Fallon's mom's favorite interpretation of like a demon creature. Mm. She was telling me. She was telling me last night. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a terrifying caricature. Um, and then I just wanted to give a shout out to the cinematographer as well because this person has worked on a lot of other fantasy stuff like Labyrinth um excalibur he did the cinematography for excalibur oh uh, says i'm sorry his name is alex thompson and he's a british cinematographer and award-winning cinematographer um so like ridley scott just really put together this like amazing team of like uh, of people to just like create this fairy tale world that he had this vision for back in like the early like late 70s early 80s like this was a thing that he'd been working on for a long time um, and with Alex Thompson, it, I mean, it kind of makes me want to lean into maybe doing some, like some of his, like Excalibur, I think would be an interest, interesting one to do because that's one of my favorite, um, interpretations of, uh, the story of King Arthur. He was the director of photography for Demolition Man. <laughs> and Cliffhanger. Yeah. And Cliffhanger. <laughs> and, yeah, he's uh, done a lot. and, uh, and, um, uh, Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet. Oh, cool, cool. Like he's done, he actually did a lot of the Kenneth Branagh uh, Shakespeare stuff. He did Scarlet Letter in 95. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this guy's been all over the place. Yeah, this guy's done a lot of great stuff. So yeah, I just wanted to, you know, give a shout out to them. And I feel like uh, the more that we could try to, like, work into the cinematographer's thing, that'd be cool because the world of the cinematographer is really, like, accents with the director's vision, too. Like, they have to really create this world together because it's, you know, a visual... Um, um, for uh, 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 media, you know. Yeah, totally. Um, do you have anything, any, anything other to add before we move into reviews and stuff? No, not really. I don't think. Let me look at my notes real quick. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Okay. Well, nope. why don't you? Uh... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, why don't you uh, go into um, our uh, 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 your uh, reviews, what you found? Okay, cool. All right. Starting off uh, with the positive, we have from Ed Gonzalez at Slant. What with the film's cotton candy mez in the scene, rhyming goblins, mortal would be turned to ice. Here be goblin paradise. Sexless, sexless pixies and elementary light slash dark metaphors that reference the order of its universe. Legend is a gothic fairy tale brought to life. So basically, not a lot of substance, but visually it's cool. <laughs> it's kind of like how I interpreted that. Sorry, I was trying to find something. Um, yeah, no, that, yeah, the whole rhyming thing, it like, at first I was like, oh, this will be kind of cool. And then quickly I was like, okay, I'm over this. Really? I was really yeah. into it. I, I really felt like it, it was a fun little, like, <laughs> Were you were you unsure if this was a fairy tale? Don't worry, we got riding goblins, <laughs> dude. Right? Well, even I it's like it. I'm, I'm trying to remember the opening scroll. I kind of actually I wanted to find it and read it. <laughs> um, where's my other one? Here it is. Uh, Variety uh, staff not credited. Um, Legend is a fairy tale produced on a grand scale, set in some timeless world and peopled with fairies, elves, and goblins plus a spectacularly satisfying Satan. At the same time, the basic premise is alarmingly thin, a uh, compendium of any number of ancient fairy tales. Yeah. Like, it's just kind of a generic fairy tale in its own right. Yeah. Yeah. It really, I'll, 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 these all kind of just say the same thing over and over again. Of like, mm-hmm. It's just visually it's rad, but there's no substance, and that's why I got the Blu-ray extended director's cut, because I'm like, what was the story in this? No, exactly. Um... I kind of have like a thought with that. Do you have any other reviews that you want to bring up before I kind of get into that? Um, yeah, the last one uh, for I'm just gonna finish the, the whole, you know positive negative blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Washington Post Tom Shales uh, legend may turn out to be legendary, but not in the way the filmmakers intended. As a flight of fancy, it has a balletic uh, grace of the Goonie Bird crashing on takeoff and spending the next ninety minutes in a fluttering tizzy on the ground. <laughs> Jeez. A uh, goony bird. <laughs> <laughs> I picked it for that phrase. That phrase. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the, as I was finished this movie, and like I was gonna kind of get back into my uh, review, writing my reviews with this one, but with the last couple of weeks kind of being where like we, it just kind of like uh, left me. Um, it. 
I was starting to like this movie is really it's just yeah like they were saying like a basic fairy tale story it's a a story of morality of you know not even morality but just like light versus dark good versus evil um and I was really trying to think of like what is really the message inside of this like good versus evil and like really it just comes down to like accountability or like you know like like when Lily touches the unicorn, she ruins everything and she has to be held accountable for that. And that's where the story just kind of like goes into then now Jack has to save the damsel in distress who made like, it's, it's almost, it could also, you could also go into biblical stuff and this is like Adam and Eve idea, you know, oh, and the she's the one that, fruit. She, yeah, she, she bit the forbidden fruit, you know? Well, I was cracking up too, because at a certain point, you know, uh, Jack, Tom Cruise's character gets all pissed off that she wouldn't touch the sacred animal. And then she says, I just wanted to touch it. And it's like, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just wanted to touch exactly it. That's exactly the, that's the issue. <laughs> you weren't supposed to touch You're it. You're not supposed to touch it. Don't touch it. No touchy. No touchy. No touchy. I don't know what that's from. But, that's, that's, but from. that's like, but that like becomes like the problem too. That's becomes what, when it became so choppy, there was just a lot of things that felt like plot points that were just kind of missed and we just kind of rushed over like quick, like we got to get to the next scene. And yeah, it's, like, well. it's, it's, yeah, it's like kind of rushing through bullet points, mm -hmm. you know, um, which is also like, it, it turns into just the story of like love can love triumphs over evil, you know, love triumphs over everything. But there is the message at the end with darkness <laughs> laughing over everybody in happiness imprinting this idea that oh but darkness still is there and darkness is still in everything there might be light and happiness but darkness would always be there yeah it's just a lot of ideologies kind of thrown in a blender with yeah. a fairy tale aesthetic <laughs> exactly <laughs> um i did find the opening scroll of, okay. of it and it literally literally just reading that like you don't even need to really watch the movie. If you just read this, you know the story. Everything else is just kind of like, oh, and now let's watch it happen. So it's like, literally reads, Once long ago, before there was such a thing as time, the world was shrouded in darkness. Then came the splendor of light, bringing life and love into the universe. And the Lord of Darkness retreated deep into the shadows of the earth, plotting his return to power by banishing light forever. But precious light is protected, harbored in the souls of unicorns, the most mystical of all creatures. Unicorns are safe from the Lord of Darkness. They can only be found by the purest of mortals. Such a mortal is Jack, who lives in solitude with the animals of the forest. A beautiful girl named Lily loves Jack with all her heart. In their innocence, they believe only goodness exists in the world. Together, they will learn there can be no good without evil, no love without hate, no heaven without hell, no light without darkness. The harmony of the universe depends upon an eternal balance. Out of the struggle to maintain this balance comes the birth of legends. That was so long. <laughs> Did you read that entire thing when it was scrolling? You were like, ah, I don't give a fuck. No, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did what I did what you did. <laughs> I read it out loud. And like, <laughs> Once upon a time, um, yes, I mean that's pretty Once much long ago, before there was such a thing as time. Sorry. Yeah, I mean that's like really it. I mean, I mean, I guess it is kind of like a prelude of like, and now we'll see them overcome darkness. You know. Yeah. But it really was just like even just like the metaphors, the the idea, like everything is just kind of like. Bop, bop, bop like put into you right at the beginning of the story and then it is really cool that the next thing you see is this most terrifyingly actually gruesome moment of one of the like people of darkness whatever the fuck they are just chopping a person that's still alive they're screaming in pain by this fiery pit and they're just getting chopped up it's like ah, ah! like what the fuck well, that's what that's what that, that's what goes into this whole like loft uh, footage thing is because there was a lot of imagery in this that was really dark like they were going to really lean towards this darker tale and if you read other like uh, articles online and everything there, it was there was supposed to be a way darker movie but then the studio was worried about marketing so they did all these cuts 
Yeah. Because there's that. There's the frozen to death baby in the crib. Did you catch that one? Nope. Like, how yeah, do I when, miss that? When winter, when, you know, how oh, winter. Shit. Yeah. And it cuts to the family frozen. Before you see the family sitting at the table, you get, you see a crib and you see a frozen little baby hand. Oh, my fucking God. Yeah. I was like, whoa, okay. But then it's like, it, it never, like, it never committed to being this ultra gothic no. fairy tale. If anything, it, it committed more to like the goofiness of it, and a lot more yeah, but, scenes. Yeah, but the goofiness seems like a second thought. No, yeah, like oh, we need to plug this in to make it more accurate for its PG rating, yeah. basically. And yeah, it was like like you're saying, there's that whole scene where they're seriously hacking this person. These demons are hacking this person alive to make him into a pie. Mm-hmm. There's a frozen dead baby. Like every, every a lot of the imagery was really really dark, but they never really like like committed to it entirely Mm -hmm. yeah what a weird movie it was interesting i definitely it was definitely interesting watching it again i think the last time i watched this may have been when i was in high school actually um but like yeah i i I didn't i remember really liking it but now re-watching it i was like this really is not that I was I was very uncaptivated through most of it. I felt very taken back, and I think that was because it felt like it was moving through plot points. You know, I kind of had to like push myself into really like focusing in on a lot of the story to make sure that I wasn't like missing anything. But then I felt like I was still missing a lot. But yeah, but I like again, I don't think that was you. I think that was just the writing touch. No, exactly. There's a lot, yeah, there's a lot miss. There is a lot missing mm-hmm. to it. You know, um, I mean, you gotta love. You gotta wonder how much. Uh, uh, their budget was for uh, glitter. Jesus, I wonder. Oh, a lot of glitter. <laughs> so much glitter. It's the glitter falling. Whenever that uh, the fairy, whatever her name was, was floating around. U- U- Una. Ula. Ula. Un- Una. 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 Uh, Una. Like double O N A. Una. No, Jack. That's our secrets. Dude, she was also terrifying as hell as well. <laughs> yeah. She's also Wasn't like she? weirdly like seducing him through this all. It's like this. This has got like date rape written all over it. It was very Peter Panian. Yeah, very much so. Like literally, like yeah. It's like let me take a little bit of this fairy tale. Let me take a little bit of this fairy tale. Let me take a little bit of this fairy tale and put it all together in an amalgamation. And plop. yeah, she she was a she was a very unnerving. But what I liked about that too, though, is kind of like now I'm thinking about it and like. Uh, hindsight that's kind of fitting for a fairy to have this kind of unnerving you know what i mean a lot of yeah. the times they're pre- it does do that that uh tinkerbell thing where they're a little they're a little unhinged you know well i mean <laughs> if i remember correctly through just like actual like stories of like mythical creatures like in their idea like the ideology behind was that fairies they're also they're like they're little tricksters too you know like like they're they're i shouldn't say tricksters they're mischievous by nature yeah, you know, like trying to get the Lost Boys to straight up shoot a bitch. You know? <laughs> that's one of my favorite things ever. I really think that's like hilarious. <laughs> it's like, quick, shoot that big swan or whatever the hell she calls Wendy. Oh. <laughs> um. So, do you want me to? I can. Do you want me to go through my weird bullet point thing really quick? Just get the message of the get the idea of the story out there for us to talk about. Sure. All right. So, what is I? I got opening scroll, which I already read. Darkness wants darkness. Lily is mischievous. Jack is Tom Cruise. Um, touch unicorn. Bad. Winter and horn cut. Fairies and Jack the champion? Lily and unicorn caught. Journey to the center of darkness. Light defeats all. Jack believes in Lily. Darkness into the void. Happy ending? Question mark? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> all right thanks for joining us everyone um i mean there's obviously like obviously you know like little bits of just like things that have like there's this there is like that weird side story with una and jack um i don't know what the fuck's up with that satyr who is fuck just bipolar through this entire movie you know what i mean or it's like oh uh she the touched rump? the unicorn <laughs> oh but you rump, love her rump. how happy now like what 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 side are you on right now, bro? Well, and also just that well, I don't know, like that whole dubbing over voice thing. Oh, was their voice dubbed over? 
Yeah, the the to get that like effect on it. Oh, weird. Okay. And it look it just looks off. It looks really bizarre. And, well, and to be honest, and I think this is kind of like a thing I've kind of noticed, especially in like eighties fantasy. Um, the sound is always a weird issue. It's like the whenever like the the entire movie is on this like one keel like volume wise and then suddenly a yelling part will happen or like a song like a a swell of a music to really like get the emotion that you're trying to go for you know terror you know we we mm -hmm. need the audience to feel scared so let's put this song in right now the volumes get so ridiculous mm. like tom cruise yelling lily was hysterical lily! you know like it, it was, was also like slowed down just enough yeah like, just, and it's just, like you're like it's like you're really forcing this idea of like over -dr dramatized like performance. Yeah, it's already it's really just... over the top, and now you're making it feel more over the top. Now it's just becoming really goofy. Yeah, like him yelling, Lily. I just really like I, I, I appreciated and hated it all at the same time. Well, that's an interesting thing to think about because you're specifically talk calling that out with the '80s, and I'm pretty sure the '90s kind of had some of that as well. Um, maybe even the 70s, because I think what you're looking at, what you're pointing out, is possibly just like uh, an older film technique that at the time was like captivating for an audience. But now that we've like as a as a society and culture of media, we've we don't need that spoon fed anymore. And now it's not captivating. Now it just looks looks ridiculous. No, it's distracting. Yeah, now it's now it's it's take it's taking away from the moment. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of things like a lot of like earlier movies. Instead of like, they would they would kind of like tell what they you know, like. You're supposed to be like showing the story more. You know, like let the audience interpret it as opposed to like tell them what they need to see or what they need to feel. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, like, I think that's an interesting thing to kind of think about. And, like, maybe we should kind of, like, let's let, let's keep that in our banks as we watch more, like, earlier cinema or, like, you know, later cinema versus earlier cinema and whatnot. Yeah, no, and I just, I think the reason it's really standing out, too, is because it was the same thing with, I mean, granted, I didn't re-watch Willow, but with mm -hmm. this episode, I was, you know, getting, like, flooded with memories of it and everything. Yeah. Um, but it's like with Never Ending Story, Willow, and this, they all three of those did it. Maybe it just seems a lot like fantasy because it's like three in a row, basically. That mm -hmm. I mean, that. It, it's probably much more of like a fantasy element because it, with that whole like, you're already in a world of um of fan of fantastical things. You know, <laughs> you're already like have this like different like level of disbelief. You know, um, mm -hmm. what what I'm trying to think of the term, uh, like. I, I, uh, but anywho, um, and so with that level of disbelief already there, like you can like be a little bit more exaggerative in like your like showing of the performance and whatnot. So like, but in the eighties, it was more like that was like how they like that was just part of the aesthetic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if yeah, you think yeah. about fantasy now, well, I mean fantasy now, I like what like I would say. Like Lord of the Rings really kind of like re revitalized, re like changed, uh, changed. I think yeah, I see where you're going with that. I mean, Lord of the Rings definitely brought fantasy into a into how to how to word this into a realm to be taken seriously as a motion picture art form. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm trying to think between if there or stuff music and that. costumes and mm -hmm. like just the budget alone of what you could create. It's you like know? It, I think it that... made it seem like it was real. Yeah, because then now you have on the other, like, I mean, I would honestly say like the next thing to really kind of change a lot of stuff would be like Game of Thrones. Yeah. Was, oh, redefine, I guess is the right word. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Like Lord of the Rings and like Game of Thrones redefined a lot of like, like even now, if you're like if you watch like uh, something like you see a Game of Thrones, and let's say you watch something that uh, has less like popularity, like Witcher, for mm -hmm. example. Now, because Game of Thrones pushed this envelope of uh, how fucked up we can make fantasy, a lot of more adult fantasy stuff is following suit. Yeah, well, and I guess that's another big thing to really think about that as well is just how much like 
fantasy through the 80s and even 90s it was that was it was that there were children's stories it was more about you know it was all like for children where then lord of the rings turned it and which which tolkien definitely not children's books you know um like it they're like it's fantasy for adults and then like fantasy for adults really kind of like took off even though i guess like willow kind of lives in between this world of like for adult and children in the 80s never ending story was definitely children um willow's pretty dark yeah but would willow you has a lot of cool but but also would you be like when that came out do you think the parents were like oh i don't want my children my child to watch this maybe i don't know now i'm just kind of thinking could... like dragon slayer and lady hawk i don't know Oh, I'm, I'm just thinking, like, I, I could see it more in the sense of a parent taking their child to go see Willow, and then at certain points being like, this might have been a mistake. <laughs> you know, that kind of, like... Kind of like with what happened with Gremlins. When, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, that kind of thing of, like, oh, I, I thought this was going to be way more child-friendly than it ended up being. Mm-hmm. Like, and it just, like, seems like, you know, with the, the rat dog uh, killing... The oh yeah god damn <laughs> you know stuff like that you know like where the parent might be sitting there kind of like uh whoopsies <laughs> they didn't mean for that speed my okay my child's yeah. scarred um yeah I, I, we, we just went off on a weird tangent about just fantasy in general um do you have any do we have anything more did we want to go through legend and gen, like actual like kind of like a little bit more i don't know if there's really much more to talk about with it I mean, what I definitely am going to do is when I get my hands on the extended version, I'm going to watch it and then do, like, a mini tape comparative whatever. Because oh, between the two, yeah. Like, also, what is what was up with that good guy, bad guy goblin? What was that? All right. Yeah, I guess let, let, let's just really quick. Let's actually, like, let's talk about the character arc. So we actually, like, we're, we're focusing more in on legend here and, like, the actual, like, story that was hard to find. Um I mean, so you have uh, Jack's hero's journey, which begins essentially when Lily um, touches the unicorn. And that's also a really weird scene right there is like she touches the unicorn and obviously she doesn't know that she's doing. Also, do they even st do they state at what point before that? I don't remember this. Do they state before that that if the unicorn is touched, that's when darkness can like take it over? Because it's like literally the goblin is waiting for the unicorn to become tainted, essentially, before it like spits out its um, dart to poison it and to chop off the horn. Or yeah. was it just more of waiting for it a moment of opportunity? I don't know. It's not very clear, clearly explained. It's just all of a sudden like, oh, no, touching it. Not only was it just like, oh, you shouldn't touch the unicorn, but you just doomed us all because you touched a unicorn. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like it doesn't really seem like her. It doesn't seem like her touching it caused the issue. Like, yeah, it, even well, though they kept wanting to blame her for it. Well, no, it's like it. It. it it's almost like when it's being introduced, like e like as an audience member, be like, why? Why is it so dramatic for her to touch this unicorn? I don't. I don't understand why that means anything, until you find out through what's the little satyr's name. Uh, uh, Gump. Gump. Thank you. Yeah, Gump. Where it's like it says like. With You're her... talking about the little naked boy, right? Yeah, they're a satyr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what, what, what did he remind me of? Shakespeare? Help me. In Shakespeare? Yeah, he reminded me of. Oh, uh, uh, from Midnight Summer. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, Puck. Puck. Yeah, he reminded me of Puck a lot. <laughs> it's interesting because Puck's a fairy. Um. <laughs> but I thought Gump. I thought Gump was a fairy. No, Gump was a satyr. Oh. Y you know what a satyr is, right? Yeah, Phil. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, fair. Um, <laughs> Call me Phil. <laughs> fucking Danny DeVito. Okay, so yeah, but like, so like her touching it, just like, it, did, it didn't feel like it was like, it felt like it was like, had to be explained afterwards why it was such a bad thing, even though like everyone was freaking out over it. But let me go back to my original thought on the weird scene is that, He's angry at Lily for touching the unicorn, and then all of a sudden she's like, the person who finds this ring will be the one who marries me, and she's like confessing his love to him pretty much, and then she throws the ring 
into the fucking river and Jack's just it's like Jack's like no longer angry at her now he has to like find this ring for her love I'm like where what wh- wh- huh but then also like in that same in that same in that same moment in that same sweeping moment he jumps off the rock to get the ring and then she starts screaming after like, him why like why would you do that I'm like yeah. why'd you throw the ring in the river <laughs> Why is anything happening right now? What, why and is winter is coming, thing? by the way. So, like, <laughs> fucking, like, everything's about to get frozen over as well. And, <laughs> yeah, that... <laughs> <laughs> like, and, like, so much happened in, like, a minute and a half of this, of, of, cine- of, of this movie that just all just, like, conflicted together. Like, and then he's, like, frozen underneath the river of ice and, like, 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 uh, like, Lily! so fucking just everything just got so weird and then she's just like running through the fo- through the through the snow and whatnot and uh, leads them to the unicorn after oh that, that's right so jack and like uh, and gump gump finds jack and is all like what happened or what uh, like Jack tells Gump what happens and like Gump is just like super like bipolar like hit like hisses at him like you let her touch the unicorn Jack you know that's forbidden he's like yeah but it was for love for love oh if it was for love let's cheers like (laughs) is this a good thing or a bad thing like you're in you're in frozen winterland right now like (laughs) well yeah it just goes into like again it just goes into the felt it feels like something was cut out yeah because even then it's like is it do they think that touching the unicorn will cause all of this? And then they're pissed off about that, unbeknownst to them that the thing was then poisoned and then killed, I guess. Yeah. In theory, it's dead for a little while. Oh, it's life. dying because it's had its horn cut off. Uh, the thing looks pretty dead, but I digress. <laughs> but, like, it's, 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 like, it's just one of those kind of, like, you know, like, because, again, you know, the whole movie is a carrot. You just go, okay, I guess. Well, I mean, as fairy tales can generally be sometimes, you know, like, because, like, a fairy tale generally is supposed to be, you know, a story of morality, you know, and, like, have a message for, you know, you know, uh, uh, what is that, like, a warning for children or some sort, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah. Um, but, like, I guess. Well, then it goes. Yeah. yeah, well, th- but then it gets into this whole, okay, so the unicorn's horn has been taken, which the goblins now can use as, like, a magic wand. Because the magic because... of the unicorn. Yeah, it's a uni- it's unicorn's magical. Got it. Cool. Uh, it's fine. I, that's fine. Uh, I'll take that. Um, but then it cuts into them talking about how we need a champion, and basically, Jack, you're our champion because you're sitting here. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> kind of that. You're, you're, the, you're the human around here, I guess, you know. <laughs> Yeah, but then so they take, like, Gump is like, uh, oh, I know we can get weapons, takes them to some cave that for some reason Gump can't go into. Yeah. No one else, no clear. one can go into except for Jack and Una. And Una. Yeah, for whatever reason. Which is then when Una, to... Una very clearly becomes, becomes large, like, as, like, uh, they're into her humanoid form, and very clearly cut from, like, neck, like, like neck up to be like she's clearly naked in front of this guy right now well then he gets his little short skirt armor <laughs> i thought you were gonna say something else he gets his little <laughs> uh, uh, he yeah he's slightly like... seduced by una you can tell he's like like oh she's pretty uh, uh. There's fairies, like... But, but, but fairy... i love lily i love lily but there's fairy dust everywhere the glitter is enchanting me Dude, the glitter, man, it was killer. <laughs> glitter and bubbles and sparkles, and it was just over the top. But then it, like, just kind of, I mean, I don't know. Well, it quickly transpires, like... Oh, it's just, like, it's actually weird to think about. A lot actually happens in this movie, because it's just, like, fifth, like, like a minute or two of each segment to kind of, like, move the story forward. So, like, if we were to actually go through, like, each beat of this movie, it would be kind of, like, an hour and a half, two hours long of us just talking about that. Yeah. You know? Because, like, it's, like with this, like, he gets the ch- he gets the sword and the armor and the shield, and then it cuts to um, uh, uh, Pox or Brown Tom, one of the, like, little, like, gnomes or dwarves. I think they're gnomes. 
um, who is protecting the live unicorn. But then Lily shows up and that's when she brings all of the like Blix and all of the other like the evil, the darkness force towards the other unicorn where she gets captured in the unicorn and Brown Tom is like, you know, with his fucking frying pans, like, bling, 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 bling. <laughs> like, dodge, like, deflecting all the arrows. This made me think of Samwise Genji. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, and then, like, at the, and then right at that last second is when Jack and Gump and the rest of the heroes show up right at the nick of time. Like, like you see, like if we were to go like beat by beat, we just like this movie is strangely long, actually. Because <laughs> like, I guess the next biggest stuff really that I mean to kind of like bullet point it and narrow it down more is they go through this like swamp area where there is a terrifying creature that's too quickly killed. Like the amount of makeup that went into that goddamn creature is amazing, and the like whatever oh, like, puppetry. The, like- um, swamp witch. Yeah, what was her name? Or whatever she was. Yeah, uh, uh, Meg Mucklebones. Um, like, which also that was the thing that terrified me when I was a kid. That scene scared the hell out of me when I was a child. She reminded me of uh, Craig. I drink Bailey's from my boot. Remember that? Oh, old Greg. Yeah, that's what <laughs> she reminded me of. Old Greg. Old oh, Greg. I got the funk right here. I keep it in a box. <laughs> You like Bailey's? I got Bailey's in my boot. It's the closest you get to Bailey's without getting your eyes wet. <laughs> I like to drink Bailey's in my boot. <laughs> my name's um, Old Grey. <laughs> Sorry, <okay. laughs> but right, didn't she remind you of him? <laughs> I, yeah, and, and now that you say that, yes. I can like totally see that. They're cousins. <laughs> yeah, Old Grey is actually in the swamp next over. <laughs> and, yeah. And the other fairy, totally. and the, the, the fairy tale across, across the swamp. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so like, see, we, we get into the castle and it's just kind of them. Pretty much the majority of the movie kind of takes place in this castle at this point. But yeah, this is about the, the, the second half of the movie. And it keeps yeah. kind of, it like, it keeps cutting in between, like, with Tim Curry uh, as darkness, just kind of like sitting, like, oh, follow her. Tell me what I must do. Why do I feel this feeling for this woman? What is this feeling? You know, like, yeah. And then dark, and then father echoing through, like the empty chair. Like he's like this is like some weird psycho shit right here. Like mother and father are just like embodiments of nothingness that he's like talking to. Like it. <laughs> well, yeah, like mother is nice, and then like father is fire. Yeah, because it seems like it kind of to me at least was kind of like resonating for, from the fireplace. Mm-hmm. I had that really cool effect of the 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 fog going in to the fire. I did, that, not, like I did not pick that up. No, you're, you're, you're really onto something that I didn't pick up. Yeah, like, it, he's talk, it seems like he's talking to the fireplace. Yeah. I guess, like, I saw that it was the fireplace, but I saw, like, the chair in the foreground. So it was kind of like this, I, like, like, I guess I was kind of, like, definitely, like, it was coming from the fire, but, like, the fact that there was the chair in the foreground gave this, like, idea of, like, there was somebody sitting in this chair talking to him. That we just couldn't see. Yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but then also, like, so, like, it, like, just alludes to, like, he has this desire for this princess because she is innocent and pure and him being... Um, and he wants creature. to corrupt her with darkness. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. it's, like, it's in his nature to destroy things that are beautiful and yeah. innocent i guess that I makes know. yeah that makes sense yeah darkness wants to destroy anything like pure and innocent yeah that's 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 the metaphor there but um, then like i i have to say one of the coolest scenes in the entire movie is the black silhouette dress this the the dress the dress seduction yeah i think that that was also because that that gown is gorgeous it is actually pretty fucking awesome. That's, it's really with the with the big collar mm-hmm. and then her her makeup with the black lipstick and everything. I mm-hmm. just thought that whole scene was really cool looking. No, they do a really good job of making her go from looking very much like sweet, pure, innocent with the white dress and the you know looking virgin like type thing to then the like deep cut you know like V dr- V neck dress. That is a deep cut. It is a very <laughs> deep cut. Yeah. Um, um. Yeah, and looking very. But it was much, also like yeah, evil empress. Was, yeah, and it was cool too. I mean, that scene was just really cool too because it was very uh, 
well done because it was very unnerving, but there were, it was very simple. Yeah. It was yeah. a very simple scene, and it was very, like, just this, this is the embodiment of, like, temptation. And yeah. And all that was just very interesting. And, and the seduction was, like, through the dance and whatnot. But there was a moment where, like, when she's about, before she gives into it, where she kind of realizes, if I remember, I, maybe I'm, I can't remember if I'm, I feel like there was something where it's like when she was tempted with it, she kind of like had this choice to give in to then maybe prevent what was going to be happening. It's like she gives into it or maybe that was something a little bit later because there's like there's something there was something I remember seeing that alluded to the fact that she wasn't going to f- like fully give into darkness. It was definitely when there's a there's a sp- specifically a point in that scene where she's kind of in the corner and the the shadows of the dancer are kind of like bouncing off of her face and she looks really terrified Mm -hmm. and that looks like the moment that she's really pulling away but then the dancer grabs her and starts twirling her around yes 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 and then she starts twirling and dancing and And that's that's when she twirls into the dress yeah yeah and then that's like so there's a moment of like kind of like fear where she looks like she's gonna resist i think it may have been like a moment of hesitation i saw with her when darkness is talking to her in the dress at one point then because i feel like there was definitely there was something that felt like it was a setup to her actually kind of like helping save the day at the end but well we we don't have to really go too far deep into that um darkness and the goblin king have things for underage girls apparently (laughs) no me and sarah was uh like 18 19 when she filmed this she was 17 she fil- oh, yeah, because it was filmed late, like, in, like, 83, 84. Yeah. Wow. 17 for the, the stuff. Because <laughs> I, I did the math when uh, she, when the, when it was released, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, me um, and Sarah and Jennifer Connelly. <laughs> still blows my mind that Jennifer Connelly was, what, 16 in the filming of Labyrinth? Something like that, yeah. That yeah. was crazy. Um, but, uh... These so- movies are creepy. <laughs> <laughs> The eighties were creepy with young women, dude. Like in general. Like the eighties. God. Um uh so like through like a lot of like the journey, like it's like, yeah, Jack and his crew, they like spend a lot of time through this castle, just kind of like little minor obstacles that they overcome. It ultimately comes into Jack kind of like create it comes up with this idea of of reflecting light through the castle to defeat darkness. So then when they finally do confront darkness, then he, they can have, like, the beam of light to save the day. Um, but, like, the big, I would say, like, the beginning of the climactic scene is darkness has the unicorn chained up. And then Lily, as, the, as dark Lily, I guess, she's saying, I'll do the final blow. Let me do the killing blow of the unicorn. And he's like, yes, I've corrupted you enough. Do it, my darling. And uh, Gump is like, Hilly. Kill her, Jack. Kill her. She's going to do it. She's going to kill the unicorn, Jack. Kill her. And Jack is like, I believe in you. I believe in you, Lily. Don't don't prove me wrong. Love. I love you, Lily. Like, uh, the very overly drawn out dramatic scene of finally Lily cutting the fucking chain free for the unicorn. And then Jack shooting an arrow into Darkness's neck. <laughs> yeah. And I will say something I did, like, I thought that was kind of just kind of a cool line, too. This is earlier when the goblins are kind of talking about, like, what's the big deal? Just the girl unicorn is left. The girl unicorn is left. Mm-hmm. Like, what's, what's the problem? And he goes, yeah, she only has the power of creation. Like, mm, yeah, I just thought that was an interesting little, like, no, you guys are idiots. She can make more. Like, yeah. <laughs> she, she is the female. We need to kill that one. Hey, wake up, buddy. Wake up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so pretty much leads into, uh, the fight with Jack and darkness. Um, Jack almost gets killed. Jack loses his sword. He attacks darkness with a unicorn horn, stabs him, stabs darkness in the gut. And then darkness, very dramatic scene of darkness. Well, finally they get all the lights, the plates positioned properly for then the light to reflect onto darkness and, and then darkness is pretty much like getting blown away by light into this weird void of whatever the fuck that is. Like just in, in his castle, he has just like a, a tell a, a dimension to space open <laughs> and uh, yeah, his, his, a, yeah, his get, teleportation into darkness or whatever, you know? Yeah. That was really the weird. void. Again, yeah, it made me, was... it literally made me think of the nothing in, uh, uh, never ending story. Never ending story. Yeah. 
No, I, I was like, okay, so there's I mean, just a portal to if space. Really, if you really fucking think about it, like, darkness overcoming light, this is pretty much the nothing from never-ending story trying to overcome, like, take over, uh, take the world over. Never-ending story is a parallel universe where darkness ended up killing the unicorn. There we go, yeah. Yeah. Way to go, Bastion. <laughs> <laughs> um... So yeah, finally, yeah, darkness gets blown into the void, but it's he's not officially dead or anything. He's just blown away because at the very end, this everybody like is you know joy and they oh that's right they put the they put the horn back on the unicorn and it's alive and it's okay. There's happy music playing with bubbles and glitter. Jack and Lily live happily ever after, and then darkness is image like the face of darkness comes up. <laughs> This whole movie, I feel like on the soundstage, they had a big fan, and they were just throwing buckets of glitter into it. Probably. Code everything with glitter. All of it. I mean, but, you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much, I mean, I don't know. I think it's just, at this point, we just need to get into the the rating. Oh, yeah. we Yeah, let's wrap up. Oh, man. I, it's definitely not a gremlin. I give it a wet mogwai mainly yeah. because visually it's it's cool visually. Like visually, it's really rage. cool. It really it kind of like with Never Ending Story, it really kind of like has this cult following. Really inspired a lot of people. Um, and the art direction in general of this movie is just really, really, really on point. And I really think that there is going to be something to this like director. Yeah. So like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back around in a couple, like a week or so and do some kind of like mini tape or something on it because I am very curious what the original idea was because that's like a theme that we always talk about is that when a studio and what's weird about this too is when a studio gets involved and wants to make all these changes, Ridley Scott apparently was very not I don't want to say adamant but he was very um, receptive to these criticisms even to the point where after a test screening he heard complaints from goers took them into consideration into the cut oh interesting and even on the commentary that's on the dvd that i ordered apparently he's still very proud of it granted is it his favorite piece he's ever done no but for what it is he's very proud of what was created and i'm just really curious what the original idea was going to be yeah we should i would love to actually um have like a a, uh sit down together to watch that i'd love to watch that together cool yeah that sounds like fun um, yeah, I agree. Definitely wet mogwai. Because, um, yeah, it definitely, it just, it doesn't really stand the test of time. And that's kind of like, I guess that was kind of our original, uh, like, uh, uh, step into all this with Neverending Story and Legend is how well does it stand the test of time to today's, like, a uh, fairy tale and, like, um, fantasy genre and whatnot. And I can definitely see how this influenced a lot of fantasy cinema and uh, just and it's just like very much fairy tale, but it's definitely not as captivating as it probably once was when it first came out. Yeah, no, it definitely did not age well. But the influence, like you said, the influence has, is definitely there. I will for... say the makeup and uh, like the like the practical effects of the makeup and whatnot aged very well. Yeah, I was actually I was pleasantly surprised when darkness comes out of the mirror. I was like, that's actually not as bad as I thought it was gonna be. Yeah, there is. Yeah, that was actually really really cool. That was. Yeah, and the prosthetics and everything were great. Oh, like, amazing! I mean, even Blix looks really fucking good. I was reading that Blix uh, was uh, inspired by Keith Richards, <laughs> which I think is really funny because oh it's my not god, true, I hope it that is looks true. Like a, I it really like hope him. that is true. That is so fucking good. It looks a lot like Keith Richards. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, that is... Oh, my God. So good. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would recommend this to somebody if uh, they did have uh, an interest in, like, makeup design and where it's come and everything, because just the creatures alone. Like, I mean, I guess more, more than anything, the evil creatures are very interesting, because yeah. at the end of the day, like... The, the good guys do have makeup, but it's, you know, they're like prosthetic pointy ears and yeah. beards and stuff. But the full body makeup that they did for the villains was really cool. The, the two like gnomes or whatever they are, uh, like Brown Tom and uh, Pox, they, there is some good prosthetics on their faces that aren't distracting or anything and actually look very 
uh, very much in that world. I guess I'll put it like that. The makeup really like it defined this world in a good way and it felt like it belonged in it and it created it and it like it helped uh, accent it. Yes, that's yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah. Um, I think that's about all, uh, all I have to say. Yeah, that's pretty much all I got. Cool. Uh, we don't know what we're doing next week. We don't. We gotta figure that out. Oh, I do like the unicorns, uh, noises, by the way, were like blue whales or some shit. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. The, yeah, uh, they're definitely a whale. I, I really didn't really exactly think about the noises were. that the unicorns were making. I was just thinking that was ambient sound, so. Yeah, they're like an orca or some shit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, they're de- it's definitely a whale. I just don't know. Can we be the Anyways, dino? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we don't know what we're doing next week. We will discuss that, figure it out, and then you will know when we do. Yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, hopefully, next week we're back in a recording studio, and yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll have our lives back together. Um, if not, well, well, we'll figure it out. But uh, thanks, say uh, yeah. Thanks, guys, for listening. Uh, like, subscribe, share, do the stuff. Join Patreon if you want to. And yeah, yeah. Well, this is Tommy. This is Jay. And this, this is, is Tommy and Jacob's mixtape.